Hello, everyone. This is the Parks Academy, where we discuss and celebrate all things theme parks related. We focus mainly on Disney parks and resorts in both Anaheim and Orlando. My name is Paige. My name is Steven. And today we will be continuing our World Showcase series. Yes. So today we are in um, Japan. And unfortunately, um, our guest kind of last minute was unable to join us because of a scheduling conflict. Um, and so we are actually going to be tackling this one on our own, but um, Paige is going to be treating me kind of like a guest today. So that'll be really fun for me, I think. Um, and here's the thing. I'm going to ambush you really quickly because um, because of the schedule and stuff, we're actually recording this on September 4th, the day that it comes out. So we can basically uh, take advantage of this situation and say, what are you excited about this week? Ooh, did, you yeah. know, did you know I was going to do that? No, yeah. we haven't done this in a while. Mm -hmm. What am I excited about this week? I am excited about the fact that we have renovated our daughter's room mm -hmm. and are working on swapping the nursery over yeah. for our new little buddy. Yeah, it's I'm excited been about super that. fun. In fact, we were out today running errands, picking up stuff for our, our little boy's room. Um, we got a ceiling fan and some paint for couple projects so it's it's fun we are we're really getting close to um our due date which is you know why we have so many stockpiled world showcase episodes yes um yeah really exciting i am excited about two things um the first one well i guess the first one is that um uh you know um <laughs> Uh, football season starting up again and so um, I'm really I joined a uh, I was a part of a, a draft with a bunch of family and friends so I got to do that last night and that's a lot of fun fantasy football is pretty cool um, it's kind of nerdy but it's also kind of cool at the same time um, that's one thing but I will not belabor that what I will say that I'm really excited about is we've made a lot of uh, new friends through our um, through this world showcase and even though we've recorded almost every single one of them already, um, looking at them now and kind of anticipating their release and the ones that have already come out, we've had new friends and some re return friends on the show. And so I've really enjoyed that. And that has been pretty exciting and pretty fun. It's been really fun to make some new friends who either have podcasts or mm -hmm. who are huge Disney super fans or yeah. just have a love of the parks in general. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's been it's been awesome. I am bummed that we don't have the guests today, but... Yeah. Like you said, I'm going to treat you like you are the guest, yeah. and I'm going to run Please, the show today. By all means, let's, let's go for it. All right. So I'm going to kick it off with a question, as I do, and I'm going to ask if you have any specific memories from the Japan Pavilion. Yeah. So I have um, one very specific memory of the Japan Pavilion, and I think that you are going to mention it, but I will go ahead and just get there before you. So... Um, you and I had went to um, we went to um, Teppanito for my uh, birthday lunch, uh, birthday dinner a handful of years ago. This was 2019, so I was I don't remember how old I had turned, but we went. And uh, anyway, um, my specific memory is that we went to that dinner and it was it was very fun. And um, basically, uh, we missed the final ever, our final ever viewing of um what was the show illuminations illuminations because uh dinner dinner reservations so we missed illuminations because of reservations we and did. um i felt really bad but that memory sticks in my head because we did watch it from all the way up on the steps of teppanito and it was really nice even though we didn't get our front row seat it was still kind of a fun experience we saw the tail end mm -hmm. it was the very end but that is a great place to watch. I, I was actually going to mention, I think we've mentioned that story a few times on the podcast, but one thing I was going to mention is that it's a great spot to view the Nighttime Spectacular from, which now is Epcot Forever again. Um, but I think it does stand out to me in my head when I think of Japan. I always think, well, it's a little bit sad that the last time we could have seen Illuminations, we... Just missed it. Yeah, but like... But dinner was great. But the thing is that we're going to remember that as opposed to if we just got our seat or our spot and watched it, you know, like like you normally would. Sure. So it definitely... Um, I think that it definitely adds a little bit more of a, um, like, core memory aspect to it the does. experience. It does. Even so. if the core memory is slightly negative, it's still a core memory. Yeah, and I, I take... I, I, I take 
I take full responsibility for that. It's okay. We celebrated your birthday and we'll talk more about the restaurants when we get to dining, but yeah. it was a delicious meal. So worth it. Worth it. Indeed. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the history and the layout of the Japan Pavilion. Are so, you going to ask me about my first time at Epcot or? Well, do you remember your first trip to World Showcase? I thought we covered that in our very first episode. Just joking with you. Yeah, 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 I do. It was with you in 2017. I had a great time. Yes, good. Go, good. go ahead. So the Japan Pavilion was an original opening day pavilion, like most of the rest of the World Showcase pavilions. And it actually was conceptualized starting in the late 1970s. So this one was pretty much set as they were working on Epcot in its entirety. The theme of the pavilion is known as Japan Land of Harmony, where tradition and innovation coexist. And the current sponsor of the pavilion is Mitsukoshi, which is an international department store chain that is headquartered in Tokyo. I think there's only two in the United States, one of them in New York City, um, and then one in the World Showcase, of course. That is the main shopping spot in the Japan Pavilion. The pagoda, the Goju Noto pagoda, that is sort of the centerpiece of the Japan Pavilion. Mm -hmm. It actually stands at 85 feet tall. And there are five different levels of the pagoda, which represents the elements from which Buddhists believe all things are created. So earth, wind, water, fire, and sky. Um, So it really does have its roots in that. To the right of the courtyard, because the way that Japan is set up is sort of like more of an open-air courtyard in the middle, is the Shishinden, which is inspired by the actual one found in Kyoto, which was built in 794. And then on the east side of the courtyard, you will find some mounted samurai warriors, a bridge, and the white egret castle, which has those blue roofs on it. There's also a beautiful garden, which gardening in Japan is a super precise art. It's not just about agriculture, but a lot of times you'll see those like rock gardens or those little tiny crushed stones that are, um, how would you say it? They're like raked into certain patterns. Yeah, there's a name for it, which escapes me, but it's almost like a garden. It's like art raking. Right. Um, It's beautiful. It's so precise. Um, And then the large red... I am so sorry it's, about... Excuse me really quickly. Um, it's it's sand in a Japanese Zen garden, of sand, course. Sand, thank you. So it has the parallel lines and um, concentric circles with, you know, usually central stones and a rock. Yes. And a lateral. So, yeah, it's um, it would be considered like a dry garden. So a Zen okay. garden. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, go ahead. Um, I was just going to apologize, as we have on most of our other episodes, that I know very little Japanese. And so if I pronounce any of these words incorrectly, I am so sorry. (laughs) But I'm going to talk a a little bit about that large red Tori gate. I don't know how to pronounce that. Yeah. That's what I'm going to say. Okay. (laughs) And it is in the waters of the World Showcase Lagoon. So everybody knows what this is. It's a very recognizable spot when you are heading towards World Showcase from the front of the park. You see across the lagoon there the beautiful red gate in the Japan Pavilion. Mm -hmm. And it is typically associated with the Shinto religion, but can also be seen in Buddhism as well. Um, In general, the gate is actually meant to signify a transition, which I feel like is a really symbolic thing, that you're transitioning into that country and that world. Um, There's also a koi fish pond that is located on your way to Katsura Grill. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I think really stands out in the layout of the Japan Pavilion, as opposed to most of the other pavilions, is how immersed you are in the nature and the landscape of Japan. I mean, there are gardens and trees, and it's just everywhere. Everywhere you turn, there's a beautiful building and beautiful plants or trees or something. And that makes you really feel like you're immersed in Japan. And I already mentioned that it is a great spot to view Epcot Forever from. If you can swing it from the top of those stairs up by Tepanado, um, sometimes the cast members won't let you because it's blocking the entrance to the restaurants there. Yeah. But um, right. even just over by the water, um, it's just a great central spot, sort of mm-hmm. almost at the halfway point around World Showcase. Yeah. So it's a great little spot. 
there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about dining because there's a whole lot of dining in Japan. Oh yeah, so much. Which I didn't really realize because I think we've only eaten at one restaurant, Teppanetto. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've obviously stopped here for Food and Wine Festival, which has been a great spot to stop because they always have really great oh my options gosh. there. Yeah, they kill it with that. But I am going to start with Teppanetto because that is the one that we've been to. Mm-hmm. And that is one of the bigger um, sort of restaurant options because it is a table service restaurant. It is a teppanyaki style restaurant where yes. the food is cooked right in front of you. And here's a big old did you know, because I certainly did not know. Teppanyaki is often confused with hibachi. Mm-hmm. And I realized in my research that we have never actually been to a hibachi restaurant, but we call all teppanyaki restaurants hibachi. Yeah. So what's funny is that um, you had, when you were doing your research, you would ask me, you know, if I knew that it wasn't a hibachi place. And I said, yes, because I did know that. And there was a phase, if you remember this, there was a phase when I watched a ton of teppanyaki videos on YouTube. Remember that? Oh, yes. Where I, I would just remember. like basically watch people prepare beef, stay like wagyu and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um. So I think, you know, uh, uh, Hibachi, if if I'm not mistaken, is is just like a fire. It's like a bowl for heating. Yeah. So right? hibachi is a circular grill mm-hmm. that has just like an open grate over an open flame. Yeah. It's sort of like a grill that like a they that they have inside a yeah. restaurant like this, similar uh-huh. style. Yeah. But it's just a grated grill over a flame, whereas yeah. the teppanyaki style mm-hmm. is what you traditionally think of as hibachi. And by you, I mean like most Americans, yeah. because we don't really. I wonder. Know. Here's a here's something really interesting. Okay. You know how, like, a ton of restaurants are called, like, bar and grill? Yes. So I wonder if that's kind of like the American equivalent. Because I Googled hibachi, and there's dozens and dozens of, you know, we're in northern Baltimore, right? There's dozens of things that come up, and it's like samurai hibachi, like, you know, hibachi express, stuff like that. And so it's basically, like, all of these names just have to do with that. Um, and so I'm wondering Maybe. if that's almost the same equation of us saying like it's a bar and grill. It's like, well, they're not going to grill everything you eat. You're right. So, yeah, I think that that's kind of interesting. But um, yeah, it's weird because teppanyaki is really just those flat iron griddles yep. where someone's cooking and preparing your food right in front mm-hmm. of you. Um, so, yeah, it so, just often gets confused with hibachi. And it's like derived from so teppan is the word for metal plate on which one is on which it's cooked and yaki is um japanese for grilled broiled or pan fried so teppanyaki together that's kind of how they end up using so they're frying and grilling frying grilling on a flat metal metal plate plate. yeah yeah makes sense Mm -hmm. wow yeah um and i guess that ties in too with the name so the teppanado um the decor and the theming of the restaurant actually represents the edo period Mm -hmm. um it described it as the vivaciousness of the Edo period. Hmm. And I did a little research about the Edo period. And you all can feel free to do your own research because it was a lot. Yeah. Just a lot not... of history about, right. you know, um, the politics of the time and the ruling of the time. And so it it was just like too much to throw into this podcast where we're just talking about the Japan Pavilion. But mm, right. you can feel free to look up more about the period of the style that they're going for in that restaurant. Um, the food there, obviously, when you go to a teppanyaki style restaurant, you're getting things like steak, chicken, shrimps, scallops, veggies, all off of the griddle there made mm-hmm. in front of you. But they do also serve sushi. Yes. And they have different appetizers as well. So, mm-hmm. um, it's know. like a dual house almost like one side right. is the teppanyaki restaurant. The other side is like the Tokyo dining style. Wrong. I said style because I didn't know if it was a hundred percent. Tokyo dining's gone. I'm it is talk gone. About it. That's why I said style because yep. I was trying to cover my bases. Yep, it's it's gone. Yeah. and I'm going to talk about that. Okay, in just a few minutes because this one is uh, brand new. It just opened in August, I believe. Okay. Um. Uh. Also, a fun fact about Teppanetto is the kids' meals are served in monorail shaped boxes. Oh, fun! I did not know that because one, I've never had a kids' meal there. But two, I don't know that we've ever had a kid at our table because usually, you know, you sit at a table with, I think it's eight people. 
Right, right. Um, and you're all sort of sitting around the griddle there. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so the kids' boxes are little monorail shape boxes, which I thought that was really cute. Cool. Um, so yeah, Tepanetto. It was a great experience. We had some funny people at our table when we were there, which is why it took so long. Yeah. And they were all talking about, you know, life and human resources. It was funny because it was basically, you know, um, we were, yeah, we were sitting at a table and it's kind of a, it's better to go with a larger party because then you don't end up with, you know, people that you don't want to hear their story. And we were just basically um, sitting with a bunch of people who were like, it was several measuring their, of people. their wealth. And it, w- it was almost like they were just kind of like complaining about who had the most responsibility and stress in their job. So it was a lot of like one upping, one upping of each other's stories, and I wasn't really loving that. But it was, it was what it was. And we were just minding our business on the end. Yeah. But it was the people didn't know each other previously. They just started talking because they realized mm-hmm. they were both in human resources yeah. or something. So. And I was like, I'm an aspiring Disney podcaster. So. <laughs> that was me. But it was great. Great food. Would recommend highly. Um. Yeah. Okay. So there are several other food places. Mm-hmm. Um, Katsura Grill is a QSR. Yes. And they have sushi, noodles, salad, teriyaki, etc. Um, there's a couple stands as well. The two stands in the Japan Pavilion are Kabuki Cafe, mm-hmm. which serves sushi and then alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks. They also serve shaved ice, which is pretty popular. Mm-hmm. And um, never had or even seen this one but evidently it's a big thing Mm -hmm. they serve a beer at the kabuki cafe with frozen beer foam on top oh interesting i don't think i've had that either but it sounds kind of fun you should look up a picture of it because it looks like um where was this you said almost like butter beer cafe or kabuki cafe okay the i can't remember the name of the beer but it's a beer with frozen beer foam interesting uh frozen draft kieran beer Yes. Oh, it looks like a Dole Whip. It looks like almost like a Dole Whip (laughs) float or like a butter beer. Yeah. Universal. Kieran beer in Japan. Interesting. Yeah. So maybe you'll have to try that. So you can actually, from what I I don't know if this is outdated or not. Oh, this is from 2012, so it probably is outdated. Um, that's cool though. I love that. I really think that's. You should try that next time because that would be really good on a hot day. I definitely would. That this is a. We'll talk about it, but this is definitely a resort or a a pavilion rather that I would love to spend more time in. Um, it's just really cool, and I I think that the dining alone would be worth the, uh, worth the price of admission. That's pretty sweet. I like that. Right. Um. Yeah. And then the other stand is Garden House, Mm -hmm. and this one is big with sake. Yes. Um, they have soft drinks, also alcoholic, non-alcoholic drinks, and green tea. So that one's mostly just if you're thirsty mm-hmm. for some alcohol or not. Sake is really good. There you go. Yeah. You can stop at Garden House. That's great. Um, then the two big dining things in the Japan Pavilion. One is Takumi Te, mm-hmm. which is a signature restaurant. It is actually one of the most expensive places to eat in Epcot. Um, there are five different rooms here, each inspired by a natural element. So similar mm-hmm. to how the pagoda is tying into the um, the elements in Buddhism right, of right. the um, elements there, the natural elements that each of these rooms are inspired by are water, wood, earth, stone, and washi paper. Interesting. Which I would never have even thought was an element, yeah. but here you go. That's cool. Um, there's sort of two different options you can go for when you eat here. You can choose from the a la carte menu, uh-huh. or you can do the multi-course dining experience, which I imagine is the main event when people eat here. Yeah. Some of the examples of the food in this restaurant would be Wagyu beef, roasted duck, sushi, premier sake, and more. I There is nothing on that menu that I would not eat. I was going to say the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> I'm super pregnant and uh, meat sounds gross. Yeah. But I also don't like red meat. Uh-huh. And duck is really slimy duck to me. Duck is one of the great foods. I love sushi. Yeah. Like, count me in on the sushi. Count me out for the beef and That's the fine. duck. I just can't. Yeah. I, I, I love, like, for me personally, I mean, I, I, I love, like, a 
big meal. Don't get me wrong, but I also really like a small meal where everything on there is really fine and and delicious. Intentional, yeah. Um, because I feel like if I ate like an entire pound of duck, I would just feel kind of tired and grog down. Um, but if you have like a little bit, like I'm looking at some of their plates and stuff. Um, well, because the it's such tasting fine menu, dining. Like, yeah. I, I imagine it's small portions because yeah. usually really fancy restaurants mm-hmm. have small portions. Right, right. And that's preferable to me anyway. But this looks great. I mean, I would absolutely 100% eat there. This sounds like your kind of restaurant. Oh, yeah. 100%. Up and down. 100% it sounds like yours. Hmm. All right. The last one is Shiki Sai. Mm-hmm. This is the one that is, is the brand new, new. Yes. It opened up in the summer, correct? I believe it was August that it opened. Um, it is next to Teppan Edo on the second floor of that main building and it replaced Tokyo dining. Okay. So that used to okay. be sort of the other side. So I of was Teppan sort Edo. of right. Cause when we were there, that's, it was that's Tokyo dining was. next to it. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, but it is a brand new sushi bar and grill open for lunch and dinner. So they have lots of different options there. That's great. This is a sushi bar and grill, mm-hmm. um, a sit down restaurant, of course. So they have. Three quick service and yeah. three table service. Well, the thing, I mean, for the thing with, with Japanese cuisine is it, it, it is so expansive and there's so much to, you know, enjoy from it and so many different types of food and stuff. So, you know, a lot of these traditional style foods, it's nice to have all that, you know, all of that um, variety. So I think that's great. I love that. So here's a question I'm going to throw at you. Okay. Next time we go. Mm-hmm. If you were to eat in the Japan Pavilion, yeah, which of those options sound like where you would stop for lunch and dinner? Yeah, so I think that I would probably go to um, more than likely. I would probably end up swinging into. Did the Kabuki Cafe have food, or was it just? Yeah, that one's the that's sushi stand, yeah, I would shaved probably... ice with the frozen beer. Yeah, I would probably go there because I'd want the frozen beer. And I think sushi is a great sushi's a great food in the summer because it doesn't weigh you down and it's not heavy. And if there's one thing we know about Epcot is that it weighs you down and it's heavy. And it's food oppressive. When so, you're hot is just yeah. too much. Um and frankly, um Takumite sounds perfect. Um that sounds like the a great place to go. I think any I looked up the rooms on Google Images to refresh my memory, um, and any one of those rooms looks incredible. So, yeah, I mean, it looks great. I, I, that would be probably what I would do. Yeah, I think I would do Katsura Grill because mm-hmm. I think noodles sounds really good for lunch too. Similar reason, noodles can be really light um, if you're not having too much. It can be a really just you know light lunch. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I would like to try the new restaurant actually, yeah. the new sushi yeah. bar. I think that would be great because I do love me some sushi Mm -hmm. um, and I think that'd be nice and not too heavy. I wouldn't feel really bogged down after a long day in Epcot. So I think I would like to try the new sushi place. Yeah, that sounds incredible. I love that. Right. So with shopping, there's not a ton to say about shopping because it's really one ginormous department store and that is the Mitsukoshi um, department store, which, as we mentioned, is the sponsor of the Japan Pavilion. It has everything you could imagine. Um, it's on the lower level of that main building. Mm-hmm. They sell dolls, kimonos, jewelry, snacks, fine mm-hmm. porcelain. There's a pick a pearl experience. I saw that. That sounds really cool. Yeah. I don't know if the price is still about $20. It was about $20 previously. Um, and you pick a pearl and then they make a big to do about it they like bang some drums when they're when you get your pearl and they clean it up for you um but i think that sounds really i would love to do that yeah it sounds really neat it's like a whole they shuck and everything it's like a whole experience yeah so that sounds really fun um i don't really remember spending too much time in the shopping here we had um kind of perused it and if memory serves we spent so there's a it's broken down into like a couple of different sections. My memory is that we spent more time in the area with more traditional Japanese stuff because um, there is a lot of that. And um, we kind of passed through a lot of like the more novelty things, kawaii and stuff like that. We kind of passed passed by that um, because it didn't really spark our interest nearly as much. But I, I do remember looking kind of at some of the Buddhist statues and, um, you know, different things they had that were more traditional. 
and uh, they definitely have a, a traditional section there that that's really nice for sure for sure okay so what i would like to spend sort of the next little chunk of time on is attractions because there really is not an attraction per se one thing that's listed as an attraction is actually the art gallery which i'll talk about at the end yeah um but there have been several attractions that have been seriously talked about being added to the japan pavilion throughout different points so let's start with the most promising attraction that actually the building and rotating platform are actually there but have never been used okay so this um attraction was called meet the world have you ever heard of this no i have not it actually was an attraction that was in tokyo disneyland um it was an exact clone of the one in tokyo disneyland but for a few different reasons um they opted against it there's sort of some speculation and we'll talk about that in just a second so it was so close to opening like i said that the building and rotating platform are built but never used they Mm -hmm. actually sit behind sort of where the japan pavilion is and that current space is used for like rehearsals and storage um so speculation says that since the Japanese film omits Japan's role mm-hmm. in World War II, they uh-huh. didn't want veterans in America to be upset by that. That was one speculation. Because okay. they go through sort of like the history of Japan, yeah. but they just kind of brush over World War II as like as if they weren't part of it, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm not trying to No, no, no. Insert my opinion so wait, here sorry. because I don't know. I've not seen Can it. Can you so it's basically like a show, right? But they talk about talk, the history. Of, I'm going to talk okay. about what it is in just a second. But got the it, other, the other sources claim that the Meet the World show building was constructed with the theater on the second floor, but with some miscalculations they made during the building. Mm-hmm. The rotating theater upstairs put too much stress on the support beams. Oh, interesting. So the show building would have had to have major work redone. Okay. And they were already behind schedule, so they decided to move forward without the attraction, mm-hmm. but they just left the building there as is. And like mm. I said, they just use it for rehearsals and storage. Sure. So those are two sort of conflicting stories as to why it didn't actually open. Uh-huh. Um, not really sure which one was more prevalent yeah. or... Yeah. It seems to be that the construction element would be a bigger deal because it's like a safety issue. Like mm-hmm. you wouldn't want an attraction building to collapse right. exactly. with people in it. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what the attraction itself would have been. Okay. So the Meet the World was actually in Tomorrowland in Tokyo Disneyland from 1983 to 2002. Mm-hmm. It was a show that explored the history of Japan over about a 20 minute film. And it focused specifically on the history of Japan's engagement with the outside world. Okay. So there was this animated crane that was explaining Japanese history to a young boy and a young girl. Mm -hmm. And it was set in a rotating theater, similar to what we see in Carousel of Progress, but reverse. So instead of the audience sitting on the outside, the audience actually sits on the inside. Oh, neat. In rotating. And the stages were built around them. That's cool. So because of that layout, fewer people could sit in it Uh because the seats were in the middle. Yeah. But the stages were bigger because the stages were on the outside. Interesting. So it sort of was like a reverse. Interesting. Yeah. Um, And then the Meet the World song that was featured in the attraction was actually written by the Sherman Brothers, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. And the animatronics were all built in Central Florida mm-hmm. and then shipped over um, to Tokyo. Interesting. This almost seems like kind of a Carousel of Progress, American Adventure kind of thing. Yes. That's cool. I'm into that. Yeah. So not exactly sure why we don't have it. Maybe it was safety. Maybe it was to not upset the Patriots. I don't know, but we don't have it. The building's still there, though. So when we uh, bring it back, when we pretend we're Imagineers at the end of this episode, yeah, right, right. We know we have a space to do it. Interesting. Okay, I mean that that would have been neat. Yeah, yeah, that would have been really interesting. The other big idea 
was talked about for years, and you actually mentioned this one at some point. I believe it was during our Parks Icon series. Okay. Um, that they had talked about an indoor roller coaster similar to the Matterhorn bobsled. Yeah, Mount Fuji sort of thing. Yes, based yes. on Mount Fuji. So they had talked about a Godzilla-type creature attacking guests, and Fujifilm was actually interested in sponsoring this attraction. Mm -hmm. But get this. Do you know who one of the main sponsors of Epcot is? is Think about the photo spots. It's Kodak. Kodak. Yeah. Do you know who Kodak would not want to do a sponsorship? Fuji. Fujifilm. They're both Japanese film, correct? I... Don't know if Kodak is, but needless to say, Kodak was already a major sponsor of Epcot itself with all the photo spots yeah. being Kodak sponsored. And because Fujifilm was going to sponsor this attraction in the World Showcase, Kodak mm -hmm. convinced Disney to decline the Fujifilm sponsorship. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry. Excuse me really quickly. Um, uh, Kodak? Uh, George Eastman marketed the first commercial transparent roll of film in nineteen in eighteen eighty nine, and he um a lot that enabled Thomas Edison to develop the first most motion picture camera in nineteen ninety one. By eighteen ninety six, Kodak was marketing film, specially coded for motion picture use. So it's American. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yes, Kodak did not want Fujifilm to have a sponsorship in Epcot. Wow. Yeah, Rochester, New York. That's its headquarters. So we have no Interesting. Mount Fuji. Well, that's a shame because I think that what they could have – like there's really no IP that could go in there. We'll talk about it. But um, but what does that attraction sound like that we do have? Uh, Ever Expedition Everest, of course. Correct. So those ideas yeah. that they came up with, they actually put towards Expedition Everest. Cool. Because this concept came out way before yeah, Everest. Right, of course. And so – we did get some of those put into Expedition Everest in Animal Kingdom, which is great because we don't have Godzilla or Mount Fuji, but we have Mount Everest and a, did we figure out it was a Yeti? Um, Remember we had this discussion? Yeah, it was a it's, Yeti or Abominable Snow. It was an Abominable Snowman in, in um, Disneyland, and I believe it's a Yeti in And they're Everest. the same thing, right? It was just uh, different. More or less, depending on the where the East legend or the comes West from. Call, right, yeah. right. So, yep. So that was the second big idea. The last proposed attraction would have been a walkthrough version of like Circle Vision, but guests would board a bullet train oh. and look through windows, quote unquote, that were actually just film screens That's showing cool. various Japanese landscapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really and cool, And the train actually. would have been moving and shaking um, mm -hmm. to simulate that you were actually on a real train. Nice. So those were like the three big ideas, the most prominent and promising one being Meet the World, as they had a clone of that one in Tokyo Disneyland, and they already have the building and everything. So if they really wanted to do that, they could have done it, but it's actually now closed in Tokyo Disneyland as well. It was replaced mm -hmm. with some Monsters, Inc. attraction. Ah. In Tomorrowland there. So um, the only current attraction, which is really, to me, more of like entertainment, is the art gallery. Mm -hmm. um, right. It is an exhibition gallery which hosts long-term exhibits about Japanese art and culture. Mm -hmm. So for the last several years, the exhibit has been Kawaii, Japanese, yes. Japan's cute culture, which um, showcases different things like Hello Kitty Dolls, toys, cute little creatures, cosplay, and the setup of it. Um, once you get well into the exhibit, it's like a walkthrough of an apartment of a Kawhi super fan. So there's yeah, just like yeah. every room you'd walk through, and it just has all of these different elements of Kawhi, um, that cute culture style. Yes, yeah, I um, I like it in there. I've been in there before, and I think it's really neat. Um, they have some really cool. Some really cool stuff to look at. Now, I will be the first to admit that, that Kauai is not necessarily my um, cup of tea, as it were. Um, but I can definitely appreciate the culture. I can definitely, you know, appreciate uh, so much of of kind of what they have in there and 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 sort of, you know, the roots of 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 it. And um, for instance, like I think the Melty Go Round statue um, by Sebastian uh, Masuda is really interesting and really cool. Um, they have an entire um, 
like an entire little area. It's like a, it's like the big you know what I'm talking about. It's like the big melting girl yes, statue, the pinkish colored one. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there's definitely some really cool stuff in there. Um, I think that it definitely, I think that it definitely has its place because of how like important Kauai has become to the influence of the world. So like we were talking about how it's not really necessarily our favorite genre of art or something that we are personally drawn to. Um, but like we like pop figures and they wouldn't exist unless Kawaii existed and like emojis would not exist unless Kawaii existed. Um, you know, so many things that people really like um, really can stem from the influence of that very heavily rounded cutesy sort of style. Um, and like so much of, of even American culture is touched by that, like the direction of um um, I mean, I can name like a bunch of things that are in our house currently that our daughter likes that are based on that base, like, like our, um, what are they, this, what, what are those little things she has, the little foods that are squishy, squishmallows? Oh, yeah. So, squishmallows. Like, yeah, like squishmallows, yep. like a lot of the very rounded, cute style mm-hmm. of Disney characters. Yeah. Um, Pixar really started moving toward that in like Monsters Inc. days where everything became kind of cutesy and artsy. And then that's been a lot of like what they do for all their films, like the Disney emoji game. Um, that's all kind of, you can tell there's a huge Kauai influence there. There's a ton of Disney merchandise that is themed in this style. I mean, there's so many different brands that have really capitalized on that and Disney sells it. Um, and then people also, obviously retailers have picked up on that as well and get licenses to use Disney characters and make these sort of things and illustrators and books and mm-hmm. artists um, really pull from this style as well. So yeah. there's no doubt the influence this style has had on oh, the munch- the international munch as well. The Disney munch yes. and stuff. I mean, there is so much Disney stuff that stems I know. from that. Yep. Um, yeah, it's cool though. I mean, you know, again, it's not like my all time favorite style. I think it's a little bit too cute for me, um, but I, I, I can definitely see it's, it's you know, importance culturally so yeah i think it's a nice thing for them to have in- yeah. showcased in the japan pavilion because people might not necessarily know the history or even that that has a name i mean mm-hmm. people could clearly see you know that we see things like hello kitty and yeah. know that it's become this international phenomenon that really seems more popular in countries like japan but um to see really like the history and the evolution of this Kawhi style yeah. is really interesting for people it's educational yeah, to be exactly. able to walk through something like and this we, we talked about this before but this is like the perfect opportunity to jump back on it um tokyo disney sea um has has like so heavily embraced the duffy bear and so they have like duffy and all of his friends um there are so many different types of little characters like duffy is basically everywhere um, they have like Shelly Mae, the Disney bear, um, and, and these characters are just like, they are as big as seeing like Mickey Mouse. Right. Um, well, it really you know? took off so, in Japan compared to the United States. Right. I think. And so much of that, it does have to do too with that cute kind of art style and culture yeah, and stuff. For sure. So it's fun. I mean, it's, sure. it's, it's fun and it's lighthearted and you know, it's great. Yes, absolutely. Um, the only other big thing, uh, to note about the Japan Pavilion would be that Japanese drum show. Yes. Um, the Matsuriza, and that is in front of the pagoda, which you can hear pretty much like almost all the way around World Showcase. You can hear it at least halfway around um, World Showcase. Mm-hmm. And they usually play several times throughout the afternoon, like once an hour or something like that. Um, but if you've not had the chance to hear this, it is phenomenal. And it's just, I mean, you can be, like I said, anywhere in the world showcase and know when this drum show is happening. Yes. It's, it's yeah. just really amazing. So yeah. that's like the big entertainment thing there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is what I have about the Japan Pavilion. A mm-hmm. uh, couple questions for you as we sort of wrap up this Japan Pavilion episode. Would you add, change, or take away anything in sort of the Imagineer role? Um, And before you answer that, we talked a little bit about some IP sort of in the other episodes. And really, the only IP I can think of that is like pseudo-Japanese would be Big Hero 6. Yeah, I have thoughts about that. Well, Um, because 
I say pseudo Japanese because it takes place in a fictional place. Yes. yes. Like That's... San Francisco is not real, but clearly you can tell in the naming of San Francisco that there was some elements tied to both San Francisco and Tokyo. Yeah. Yes. Um. So I think there's a couple thoughts that I have about it. And if you will just, you know, uh, humor me, um, I, I think that, they have done a really nice job of not going the obvious route and having a lot of Tokyo stuff. Um, it's very more, you know, kind of old inspired Japan. So you have a lot of feels uh, like feelings of being in, you know, um, Kyoto or in um, um, even Osaka or whatever. Like it just kind of has this different type of feel to it. Um, right. I like that it has more elements of the landscapes of Japan as well, like the Japanese tea garden feel or something instead exactly. of instead of just Tokyo, where they could very easily have just done bright lights and tall buildings and yeah, everything more urban looking. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, and so as I look at it and I kind of think about you know, the way that it's, it's set up. Um, I think they've done a really, really nice job of it. Like, I, I don't know. I don't think that I would, um, I don't really think that I would take anything away. I think if I had to add anything though, it would be like one of my dreams. I've never been to Japan and it's, I would love to change that. Um, I do not want to go to Tokyo because the population there is 14 million. And the next most populated place roughly is, Yoka, um, Yokohama with 3.8 million. Wow. So it's really, they really, really pack them in there tight. Um, I would love to go to Kyoto. That's somewhere I would, I would love to visit. Um, Nico, I would love to visit, but probably one of the places that I would like to go to the most would be, um, Kamakura. And that is a, um, the seaside Japanese city. It's south of Tokyo. Um, but it's like the political center of medieval Japan, modern day Kamakura. Um, it's basically like a prominent resort town, um, and it has a lot of like Buddhist and temples and Shinto shrines and things like that. Um, it does have the um, the great Buddha statue, like the enormous, mm -hmm. enormous Buddha yeah. um, that I, I would just love to see and, and um, you know, photograph and stuff. So I think that if they were to add anything, I think that that aspects of, of um, Kamakura would be really interesting. Um, but I don't think that I don't suspect that adding an enormous Buddha there would really be the move because of how because of how large it is and scale. Sure, sure. When I they do have other um nods to sort of the Buddhist roots that is very popular in Japan, like with the pagoda and the gateway. Um so I I do think that they have nods to some of the religious ties and cultural mm -hmm. ties. Yeah to many of the people of Japan, which yes. is nice to be able to kind of see those elements of the culture incorporated. Honestly, I think the food has so much to offer and having the one ginormous department store is actually really nice because yeah. then you just go in one store. You don't have to like go into several different stores. Right, um, right. The only thing I think it's lacking would be just maybe if they turned that building into some sort of attraction and I wonder if they couldn't just do some sort of, I don't know, like a, I'm thinking almost like a Star Tours-esque mm -hmm. where you get inside of a ride vehicle and mm -hmm. it feels like a 3D or 4D simulated experience. Um, I don't know. I just think the technology in Japan is so innovative that it wouldn't even have to be some sort of Disney IP. It could be. I mean, it could be like something like Philhar Magic almost where you use a character yeah. like Donald Duck or yeah, and have them, you know, exploring Japan and getting lost mm -hmm. and something like that. But to have such a big space already set yeah. aside because um, we don't really have any other attractions like Star Tours. So bear with me for a minute because I'm going to go. Um, I'm actually going to go away from. Um, the Disney IP for a second. Go for it. We've talked about how I don't, we, neither one of us really think that um, Big Hero 6 would be a good fit. And this follows the Big Hero 6, you know, San Francisco opening literally this week um, in DCA, which is exciting and great. I think that if they wanted to add anything in, they should add some Studio Ghibli IP. 
Um, Miyazaki is an incredible director. Are these those films that you see ads for when you go to the movie theater? Spirited Away, yeah. My Neighbor Totoro, That's House Moving thought. Castle, Castle in the Sky, Ponyo, Kiki's Delivery Service, all those. Um, I have to admit, I was a little bit hesitant to watch them because I just hadn't ever really been super into that style. But I, I gave in and I watched Spirited Away for the first time probably like eight or nine years ago. And it, like, it moved me in a way that I was not expecting. And so since then, I've seen like My Neighbor Totoro and um, Ponyo and the rest. And they're all available on like HBO, which is great. Um, but so here's the thing, though, is um, um, I believe that I don't even believe I know for a fact that Totoro is in Toy Story 3. Really? Because he's in Bonnie's room. Oh, okay. And so they are already have a foot in the door in the Disney universe. And so much of their animated style, like like My Neighbor Totoro came out in 88. So, so much of the, like their storytelling and animated style is, is very influential on other things that we have seen today. Um, and so I think that that could be an exceptionally powerful thing to have in the park to some degree that I don't believe would pull away from Disney IP, but would actually add to the experience. Um, there is a Studio Ghibli um, land or park like an hour south or an hour outside of Tokyo. Um, okay. And so, but there's nothing else really like that. So I do think that, you know, there's a lot that they could do. Um, and I, I would, I would actually, I would welcome that. I think that'd be great. I wonder how Disney could secure something like that. I mean, again, I mean, it was in the cartoons. So, I mean, it was in Toy Story. So I don't know what more they would have to do. Yeah, but, I don't know. Um, like they could do something with like, a cat bus, you know, if they wanted to do some a ride, but I even think like a meet and greet would be it would be fine. Sure, if they sure. Do the, the, I keep going back to Totoro, but if they did like that, or you know, um, uh, there's a lot that could be done with that. I think. Um, so yeah, you know. as you were saying that, I was thinking too. I wonder if there's another attraction in either Tokyo Disneyland or Tokyo Disney Sea mm-hmm. that we don't have anything like it here. Yeah. That we could maybe, you know, borrow from yeah. or place in the Japan Pavilion. Um, just because getting to Tokyo for people who are close in proximity to Walt Disney World, yeah. like we would love to do Tokyo Disneyland and Tokyo Disney Sea, but it's really far from here. I mean, when we lived in California, not as much, but now that we're out here, yeah, it's definitely yeah. Quite a bit so there. I just like we may get there someday, mm-hmm. but the odds are fairly slim. And yeah. so I think it would be really cool to be like, here's a taste of Tokyo Disneyland, or here's a taste of Tokyo Disney Sea. Like, check out this ride and how cool it is. Yeah. And now it's giving people that buzz to be like, oh, I really want to go see what else Tokyo Disneyland has to offer. Or I really want to go see what Tokyo Disney Sea has to offer after doing this one attraction. You know what I mean? I I feel like there's room for that. And it would be really smart on Disney's part to get people excited. Yeah. About another Disney park somewhere else around the world. Absolutely. Um, Plus it would benefit Japan and their tourism, which I'm sure they already have really good tourism because there's so much to do and see um, whether it's not just Tokyo, but Uh several other areas of the country, like you've mentioned um, for kind of different things. But yeah, I think that'd be a really good idea too. Yeah. um, The, the, the number one thing that I would love to, that I would love to see in Japan is simply the giant Woody from Toy Story Mania where you have to walk through his open mouth. Oh yeah. That kind of freaks me out. That's incredible. That's like the one thing that I would love to um, to see. That's the one thing that freaks me out, is having to walk through that giant woody face. <laughs> right. All right. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to add or change or take away from the Japan Pavilion? I think it's great as is. Yeah, I think it's great as is. It, it's an exceptional part of the park. Um, it is very respectful of Japanese culture. Um, it doesn't try to do too much, but at the same time, it's not giving you too little. I don't think that there's anything missing by there not being characters to meet. Um, and I certainly don't think there's too much missing without an entertainment aspect or an attraction. Although I think that it, it could definitely use a little something. Um, but no, I think it's good. I, I'm very happy with that, with that park. The last thing I'll say here is I think of the ones we've talked about so far, Japan feels a lot less 
stereotypical yeah. than some of the other pavilions. Mm. Like, I don't walk in and just get bombarded with, like, oh, of course we're seeing that, Yeah, you know? Well, and you had mentioned, like, the koi ponds, you know? I mean, there's this huge garden that you're able to kind of wander through and artwork of bamboo, water features and stuff that, that makes such an impact upon visiting it. Um, it's almost difficult by, by how much you get to see to even have the time to be like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, of course, this is what you're going to get. Right. It's not tacky right. or... Whatever. No, because it's sort of off to the side just as you're walking through and enjoying your time. So, yep, exactly. that's what I have about the Japan Pavilion. I think it's wonderful. Well, I love it. I mean, I think we I think we did okay without a guest. <laughs> um, well, thanks for doing all that research. And uh, this was a lot of fun. Kind of felt like the old days just doing it the two of us. Um, next week, we are uh, going to be covering America. And I'm really excited about that one. Uh, we got a great guest on this episode and it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, guys, thank you so much for listening and being part of our uh, journey and our program. Um, you can uh, find us online at the theparksacademypod.com as well as the Parks Academy on Instagram. Uh, we're on YouTube, um, uploading some fun videos. Um, you can also listen to our, our shows there on YouTube as well as if you wanted to. Uh, thank you again so much to our incredible sponsors, Deep Cut and Neo Savers. You guys are the best. And uh, you can get 10% off your first order with both of those folks over at uh, their websites using the code TPA10 at checkout. Um, again, thank you so much. And uh, we, we appreciate you. And uh, if you would be willing to provide us with a kind review and rating on uh, Apple Podcast, that would be really appreciated. So we will uh, talk to you next week with America, America, and we will catch you next time.